church tonight, amen? Hallelujah. Glad to be here this Wednesday night. It's kind of that fill her up kind of night. <laughs> well, we're going to sing to the Lord, worship him tonight, thankful for the garment of praise, amen? Come on, let's worship him. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So lift up your voice to God. Yes, a praise with the spirit. worship him tonight as we lift our hands towards heaven and exalt his name. Hallelujah. God sent his son. They
you guys. <clears throat> Praise God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. We're so blessed to have you here tonight. Those watching online, our visitors here, welcome to our finest hour. So blessed and honored to have you tonight. God is good. Amen. Amen. We're going to get into uh, the word tonight, but before we do, uh, I want to pray and start, but I want to reach out our hands towards brother Tony over here. Stand up, Tony. We want to pray for you. Tony is going up um, to tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow, him and a bunch of men are going up to be witnessing and uh, passing out tracts, and 60 men going up to witness to the Indy 500 happening on Sunday, so we're going to send him out, amen? amen? Father, let's stretch our hands out towards Tony. We thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus for faithfulness, obedience, a calling, Father, to evangelize to this world. We ask and receive by faith and agreement an anointing upon Tony. Fill his tongue with boldness and power. Thank you for the move of your spirit flowing through him, Father, and all of those that are going with him. We thank you for travel mercies to and from. We thank you that your blessing and favor and anointing is upon them. We thank you that they are uh, led by your spirit, that they are favored in this environment. Father God, we bind Satan's hand. We bind the influence of sin. We thank you for anointing, for moves of the Spirit, for healings, for deliverances, for salvations, Father. We proclaim and receive them now, and we send them out with our anointing, our faith, and an agreement in your move, Father, of the Spirit upon these men in Jesus' name. We receive it now as we pray. And we thank you for our service tonight as we come into your place and into your presence, Father. We welcome your Spirit your anointing have your way, Holy Spirit, as I yield my tongue as the pen of a ready writer. Use it to minister your words of life to men and women whose hearts are open to receive in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brother. We're expecting great things. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, guys. Well, tonight we're going to talk about stop fearing. We've been talking a lot about the solical realm over the last few months, talking about doubt, unforgiveness, unbelief. We've just covered a lot of, of subjects, um, and tonight I want to just remind you to not fear and to really to, to focus on how to stop it. Fear is such a subtle thing in our world today 
um, you know, that we just, we have, we have, many have come to find acceptance with a little bit of fear. Some people even call it a good thing, like it might keep you from making a bad decision because you're fearful. But I'm telling you, there is no place in your life for fear. I'm not saying you can do away with fear. I'm saying there's no place for me to be in fear. Fear is going to come because it's a realm of the soul. Our mind, our will, and emotions are going to const- daily be presented with opportunities to be afraid, but we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to live in fear. We don't have to have all the phobias in our world today that uh, give people permission to behave <laughs> the foolish ways that they behave. We have, in Christ, an anointing, a spirit of of God that lives within inside of us, that leads and guides us and inspires us. His his love is poured out in our lives by this Spirit. His Word is brought to revelation and understanding in our lives by this Spirit. All the power of God's Word that has been given to us in Christ is empowered in us through His Spirit. That is, if you're a believer. But we have a power to overcome the challenges of life, the challenges that blow things into our life. The, 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 the things that blow into our life to get us talking about I can't. How many of us have said, I can't do that? I can't witness to that person. I can't say that. I don't have, I, that's not my thing. You know, I just, I, 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 we'll just give Tony some money and let him go do it. I mean, you know, it's just easy to find somebody who's called to do that. But we're all called to evangelize our world particularly. No, we're not all called to the world in the sense of pick up your whole family and move to some other place, but we're all called to reach our world, and in our world, it is the world. And we all are called, and we all have an anointing to do that if we'll just step out and not let fear keep us from from speaking. So many of us, we we, we allow our tongue to lead us to a place of, uh, of doubt, to worry, to fear, to anxiety. You know, I, I do believe that Paul who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He was not excluded from problems. He had problems. He had lots of opportunities in the flesh to be fearful. But in every case, we're reminded of his behavior regarding these things. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, he said, I've been hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Did you see that? Perplexed. You know what that is, right? What am I going to do? I'm not sure what to do. Perplexed, but not in despair. You know, you cannot have an answer and not be in despair at the same time. You can not know what to do and not be in fear. I can be perplexed. If you're married, you've been perplexed, all right? Like, this isn't a trick word, all right? I don't know what I'm going to do, but I don't have to despair. I've been persecuted but not forsaken. People might turn on you, but he hasn't turned on you. He won't forsake you. I've been struck down, but not destroyed. That says, I've had failures, but I didn't give up. Notice it says struck down. I I often wonder how much of that was people doing the striking and how much of it was him doing the striking. I mean, I've struck myself down a few times. I've, I've made some choices and said some things and did some actions that I thought, that was not a good idea. That was a bad decision. And yet it didn't destroy me. I don't think we really understand the power of forgiveness. The power of God's love. It's all consuming. That's all he is, is love. He, he's not capable of not loving. He is love. That encourages me that when I don't deserve it, I still have it. I might strike things down in my life, but I'm not destroyed. I might be persecuted, but I'm not forsaken. I might not know what to do, but I'm not in despair about it. Are you following me? What we do to move our thinking from I can't take it to to destruction and despair and being perplexed and crushed. What we do in our thinking that goes from, from what do I do and I just quit to what Paul said in Acts chapter 20, verse 24. None of these things move me. That's the real key. How do I get my thinking from what's happening around me to this stuff don't move me? Now listen, Paul's not preaching, nor do I believe the Holy Spirit is inspiring us to just pretend it's not happening. Denial is not an actual, real move of the Spirit. 
God does not teach you to ignore and put blinders on to problems in your life. He absolutely wants you to deal with them. But he wants you to deal with them in his strength and power, not your own. He don't want you to come up with the plan and get him to bless it. He said, no, I got a plan, but trust me. Have faith in me. Don't be despaired and don't quit. Paul said, look, all these things happen, but none of these things moved me. Moved me what? To quit, to surrender, to give up. Listen, it is not good to have any fear in our life. You cannot give fear permission because it's normal or acceptable or what everybody else does. Fear is a trap. I'm telling you, it is how the enemy traps us. It's how fear, fear is how Satan stops us from being men and women of faith. He doesn't have to get you to disagree with the Bible. He doesn't have to even get you to quit going to church. If he can just get you too afraid to do anything with what you got. That's all he's got to do. Just get you to hit pause. Think about it some more. Reason it. A lot of religious people like to do. I'm reasoning. I'm thinking. I'm pondering. No, you're pausing. You're hesitant. Thank God Paul wasn't hesitant. When he had his Damascus Road experience, as we all have had in our own ways, those things are supposed to move us to a transformed life. Not just something we can give a testimony about and go back to doing what we did. Paul never went back to being Saul. And for many of us, every time some new obstacle comes, we, we start reevaluating our life. Like, stop reevaluating your life every because something got hard. Welcome to the human race. We all are going to have things that are difficult sometimes, hard sometimes. That don't mean that we have been in sin or God has mad at us or boy we've wasted our life this is what happens the devil gets in there and he starts getting you to second guessing yourself questioning your judgment questioning your commitment he'll bring people into your life that play on your emotions and say all the right things that you know will move you to a bad decision Satan will try to intimidate you he'll use words and actions he'll use deeds of others or your own against you here's the thing we've got to remember God contacts us through words and actions and deeds as well Satan just takes something God has prevented or, or created to, to to for good and he perverts it he's using what God designed against us he tried that with Jesus in the wilderness taking the Word of God and just twisting it enough to try to use it against him but God Jesus was smart enough to know the word so he didn't fall into that trap many of us that's the problem that's how we get trapped in bondage of religion we don't know enough of the word to contradict what we hear somebody else say and so we just believe it that's why I give you my notes that's why I tell you all the time don't just swallow what I'm saying study it yourself I'm giving you all the scriptures you'll you'll find when I preach I don't use one scripture for the whole hour yeah, I preach an hour. Uh, I use multiple scriptures to reaffirm what I'm saying. I'm making my point with the word. Why? So you can go home with something to equip yourself and arm yourself. And what God's revelation he's given you in this service, you'll, you'll receive wholeheartedly. Because you went home and did a little work yourself. Didn't let pastor do all the tilling, pulling of the weeds, watering all of this. You did some of it. Hallelujah. Understand that fear brings things to pass just like faith will. Job said, the thing I greatly feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. What is the things in your life you dread? What are the things you allow to create fear? Unemployment, divorce, your children never talking to you again, sickness, that's a big one. I mean, just the perversion of our culture right now. Gets every, all of us, it, we're just human to think, man, this world is just flushing down the toilet as quick as it can. You know, that kind of thinking does, it gives you motivation to quit. You know what, I think I'm just going to put a bob wire around my house and just us four and no more. <laughs> you know, like your brain wants to go to, I do not need this, all right? But yet, God can't do anything about that without his children. He's not sending Jesus down here again to do it. So the answer is not us four and no more. It's to get out, stand up, 
don't confront with flesh but with the spirit what job was saying is that he had thought about and meditated on and spent time and energy thinking about the worst case scenario and when it came upon him what did he just see it was just confirmation of every bad thing he'd already decided was going to happen to him there's absolutely no way for fear to come against you through there is absolutely no way for fear that comes against you through intimidation or threats to become a reality in your life unless you start acting on what they're saying to you so because you're having a thought does not mean they have the right to become reality it's you talking it it's you continuing to meditate on it so that it starts to come out of your mouth and it comes out of your deeds and actions like you know you double up the gloves and the mask when you go into Walmart what are you doing you're acting on a fear or a phobia or some anxiety that somebody has placed in you. Come on. You know, when it first began, everybody didn't know what it was. Now everybody does, and yet I still see people driving around in their car by themselves with a mask on. I was walking my dog last night, and my neighbor lady around the street lives with like six family members, right? It's like an Asian family. They all live together, and, and only one of them is wearing a mask. I'm like, you are around the people you live with, and you're wearing a mask. I don't understand how fear rationalizes that. Fear brings a person to think, you know she's not wearing that mask in the house. She put it on and went out to the car and got the groceries. Like, but you didn't have gloves on. And all that stuff came from Walmart, where millions of people have touched. Fear doesn't make any sense. Only to the person in fear does it make sense. It's crazy. There's no rational reason for that kind of anxiety. You know, if zombies were running around the neighborhood, I might be a little, you know, like understanding of the mask, but that don't exist. That's in TV. There are no such thing as zombies, right? Remind your kids they're not real. That doesn't happen. That, that crazy person out there is not a zombie. We, we just start talking ourselves into these unrational, foolish thoughts and ideas. Remember, you and I are in a very strategic position in our life. Each of you have a very strategic position. You're contacted the same way by God and the Spirit and the devil. God and the devil use often the same, I'm not talking about the devil talks to your spirit, but the actions of the world, the influences of the world, people, the, things are talking to us. God is talking to us. I can, I can see God in things the world says is the devil. I can see God in the actions of, of, of life. When I look at nature, I don't see the devil, I see God. But nature can kill people. We all understand in Oklahoma the, the idea of allergies. You know why? Because we have sinuses that God gave us. It's not torture. It's not punishment. It's how God designed our body. The t punishment's living in Oklahoma. Yeah, it's not my body. It's, it's the state we live in in the perfect place for hot and air, cold and dust and pollens. Y'all know that science. Science is not a world system. It's God's system. I'm, I'm trying to make the point that we, we just try to isolate like, God only speaks to me in church. No, God speaks to me a lot of ways. In Matthew 18 and in 2 Corinthians 13, it says, By the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. You and I are establishing witnesses. We are in a strategic place in our life to establish the witness that is being given to us. The things that are speaking into our life. The Word, the Spirit, the environment, the, the, the things around us, they're all talking. And we establish that witness in ourselves. We are the ones who strategically decide, I'm afraid of that, I'm not afraid of that. 
How could you ever be afraid of that? You decided. Somebody else didn't. Are you following me tonight? I'm going somewhere with all this. You see, Satan will bring intimidating thoughts and threats, and and if we act on those thoughts, then it's going to come to pass. But when God contacts us through His Word and through His Spirit, and and if we act on that Word, or we obey that Spirit, the, the Spirit of God speaking to us, what happens? It comes to pass. The choice is ours. We are the establishing factor in our own lives. Too many people refuse to accept responsibility for themselves. You chose to do that. You chose to believe that. You chose to listen to that. You chose to act on that. We, we love to blame everybody else for why bad things are happening in our life. And I'm not denying that bad things happen by somebody else's fault. I've been rear-ended before while I was just sitting at a traffic light. That wasn't my fault. But I'm not talking about things out of your control. I'm talking about things that present themselves to your thoughts things that present themselves to your eyes and your ears, and we just receive it, and we think about it, we accept it, and we say, well, it must be true. And before long, we're that person. That anxiety, that worry, that care has become ours. Remember, the devil can't do anything unless he, comes, unless he first can come and deceive, intimidate, and threaten you. The devil cannot do anything to you unless he deceives you, intimidates you, or threatens you. Remember, he has no power. So whatever power uh, is working in your life, you've yielded to it or you've been deceived by it in some way. A threat comes and you yield to it. A deception comes and you believe it. An intimidation comes and you submit to it. And when he gets us to fall for it and act out in it, Fear is the byproduct of it. If he can get us to act on that fear, then we have given him a legal right to cause it to become reality. We give him authority to act against us by our response to his threats and intimidations and deceptions. Instead of rebuking them, instead of binding them, instead of cursing them as we have been given authority and power to do, we think about them. We, well, you know, everybody else is. That makes good sense. Deceived. All of us have been in difficult situations, and, and we've all been in spots where we didn't see any way out. But we have to remember that God always provides escape. But you've got to approach that trial with the right attitude, the right mental attitude. You can't look at things that you don't see a way out of as no way out. Because you can't see it doesn't mean there's no way out. There are a lot of things that happen in life. We don't know what will ultimately happen, but we have to trust God does. And so we have to keep moving. And when things come, we have to be sensitive. When the Spirit speaks, behave. Do it. Don't argue with them. Don't reason with them. Don't meet them in the middle. You know, I can remember when I started having kids with Jen. And, and, you know, you think you know how to parent a child when somebody else has them and you don't. But once you get them and the first time they lip you or they're disrespectful or they're disobedient and you got to punish them, That beautiful little child that your wife carried for nine months and you're working day and night to provide for and you love, then you got to discipline them. Man, that's hard. You 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 can find 50 ways to not do what the Bible says to do. Spare the rod and spoil the child. There is no except spare the rod, not put them in the corner. We were going to lunch today and drove by the elementary school and they were all out playing and there was one kid standing in the corner of the, of the playground with his nose in the fence and we all laughed, oh, I bet he did something bad. You know, now I'm, I know it's school, but, but when you're doing that at home with your own kid, like, there, there's, there's, well, well God, timeout's good, God. He didn't say timeouts. I'm not saying beat your kid. He ain't saying beat your kid. I'm, I'm saying discipline. You know, it also says that when they're older and they have a mind to reason, you don't don't spank them, you you admonish them, you reason with them. 
They'd rather have the spanking than to listen to you. When there's, I'd rather have it just spank me so I could go on. I don't want to listen to the lecture. I'm telling you, on a solical level, nobody enjoys doing that. But I know in my heart I have to. I know in my spirit that it is mine. He will not, God will not do it for me. He will, you cannot pray that out of your children. He did not say pray unruliness out of your kids. Disobedience is not prayed out. It is disciplined out. That's the Bible. That's what the Word says. And yet my flesh don't want to do that. Their tears are extra large. What do you do in that moment? It's easier to just talk yourself out of it. What am I saying? I'm saying we are creating future problems for the lack of self-control and discipline. And now, now it's so bad we let the whole world tell us that we're evil for doing what the Bible says. Because you got one nut job who does beat the tar out of his kid instead of disciplining him. Everybody's that way. Because one guy beats him with a two-by-four. That ain't discipline. That's abuse. They don't deserve to have those children. They deserve to have it turned on them, if you ask me. Spare their, you know, reap what you sow kind of thing. But that don't mean we do away with the word. I'm simply making the point. You Just because you don't feel a certain way or have some mental ang- uh, resolve doesn't mean that you're right. When it violates God's word, it's got to submit. If you don't want to discipline your kid or you don't want to do something God is encouraging you to do, you know what it is? It's a matter of trust. I don't trust that his discipline is as effective as my own. I don't trust that his way is as effective as mine. Now you can disagree with me all you want, but I'm telling you that's exactly what we're saying to the Lord. And we are saying it to his spirit. You don't have to answer to me, but his spirit lives in you and he's there when you're saying no. He's there when you're saying, no, that's not how my mom did it. That's not our modern ways, pastor. That's old fashioned. Those things have gone away. Well, I didn't see anywhere where God sent Paul down and said, erase that. Or his spirit say, never mind about that. That's Old Testament. That's how dumb people are about the Bible. Just because the Old Testament's been fulfilled doesn't mean it's done away with. No, we live in a new covenant, a new testament. The old one's not gone. It's fulfilled in Christ. So the, the, it's, it's the Abrahamic blessing. The curse is gone, but the blessing's there. So all the blessing of wisdom, revelation, instruction, truth that's in the old is still ours. I just don't have to kill animals for my sin anymore. Jesus paid it all. I'm I'm not subservient. I am a joint heir with Christ. My salvation is assured, not by my works, but by Jesus. Hallelujah! But the Ten Commandments are all fulfilled in love. Not don't do them. Oh, come on. Just because it's old don't mean it's not still God. i got to move on. You, You get what I'm saying. God has a way out. How are you going to approach that problem? I'm talking about mentally. Solically. If you don't know that God will provide an avenue of escape in every situation, then you're going to go into that problem with, un- uh, with uneasiness or doubt or negative attitude. Psalms 34, 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. See that? But the Lord delivers him out of them all. Hallelujah. I have an answer in the midst of the problem. What are you afraid of? I didn't say that fear won't ask, won't talk. I'm saying I don't have. Many are the afflictions. No one's denying them. This is the problem. We want to live a life of ease. But God didn't promise you ease. He said you're a soldier. I've given you armor. Fight the fight of faith. When afflictions come into your life, don't give up. Don't beat yourself up. Don't surrender. Don't accept it. Don't be afraid of it. Even when the pressure comes, think positively. Think of what God says in His Word. 
approach the pressure that the devil and the world is bringing against you with a positive attitude. Why do you think Brother Osteen is so popular in our world? It isn't because of his deep theological teaching. It's because he's so positive. You can't help but feel better even if you don't agree with him. You still feel better. You still come out encouraged. He's got an anointing to encourage people. Exactly. He's a hope giver. That's awesome. That's great. Is there more? Sure there's more. And there's a million other preachers preaching it. It is really nice to stay in kindergarten. You only have a few minutes of teaching and then fun and coloring and juice boxes and naps. But you can't stay there your whole spiritual life. Come on. You can't live there with somebody else doing all your lifting. That's where we all start. That's why when you've been in the things of God a long time and you look at newborn Christians and, boy, their prayers are getting answered and all these great things, and you start thinking, that ain't fair. That's because they're babies. But someday they'll be in your shoes, and things don't happen that fast because as they're discipled, they become responsible for the word they know, just like your children are supposed to. So I don't look back at that and say, that's not fair. I look back at it and say, come on up, brother, there's more. The water's good on the deep end. Get your knees wet. Get your belly wet. Jump in. Are you hearing me? The rivers of living water aren't shallow. There's lots of great things in the river. You're just going to have to get in all the way. Well, there's a sermon. Hallelujah. 1 Peter 1. Gird up the loins of your mind. That's what Peter said. He said, you know what I do with it? I gird up the loins of my mind. You know, like pull your britches tight. Do that with your mind. Sharpen your mind. Quit letting your mind float around because this is what we do. Come on, this is it. We get stressed and we want to break from stress so we distract our mind. And in distracting, it's like, like after you've had a big meal and a man like undoes his pants, oh, that's what we do in our mind. We oh, and we loosen instead of tighten. And when we do that, we allow the enemy to begin to implant things that are not healthy. All the movies and music and entertainment. I'm not denying those things have their place in our life. We're, we're allowed to have fun. We're allowed to go to the movies. I'm not saying that. I'm saying. Pay attention to your thoughts while you're sitting there. The whole mess with Target going on right now. Why would they do that? Why would they put all that transgender garbage right in the front door? Because if they can get you used to it, you'll shut up and leave them alone. They're just going to bomb you with it and hope you don't say nothing. And I hope everybody does the opposite. Stop going there and giving them your money. Go to Walmart or go somewhere else until they get the point. As long, it, it's, it's the things that we allow to continue to happen without response. If that happens in the natural, it is exactly the same in the spirit. Pay attention. Pay attention what's going on in your soul. Don't just yield to it. you got to remember fear is a spiritual force. It's like faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, Roman tells us. It's the evidence of things not seen. Are you hearing me tonight? Fear is the substance of things not hoped for. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Fear is the substance of things not hoped for. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Fear is the evidence of things that are seen. They're the opposite of one another. Faith and fear operate in the same spiritual law. One is reciprocal or opposite of the other. To better understand faith and fear, you must comprehend the platforms from which these forces operate. The kingdom of God, faith. The world system, fear. What system are you in? This is, goes back to you have control of you. You are the, the deciding witness. You have the word speaking and you have the world speaking. And you are the end result of those witnesses in your life. 
everything in the kingdom of God, it operates by love. And according to Galatians 5, 6, faith works by love. It's love that forms a foundation for faith. You know, back to the discipline in your kid. You can look at that as, I can't do it, or you can do it in faith. And say, Father, let your love be expressed in this discipline. And help me to do it in a way that I don't have to do it again because it works the first time. Now, do not make me do this again. How many times do I have to spank you before you learn? What are those words? Those sure aren't faith words. I love you. Do you understand why you got spanked? Do you understand why you're being disciplined? Do you know I'm doing it? Not because I am mad at you, but because I love you. Be a grown-up. Things get hard financially. Don't start talking your poverty. Talk to it. You don't have a right in my financial life. Father, I thank you that your word is true, and as I have sown and given, you are faithful to perform that word in my life. I am a steward, and I am a good steward of your blessing. It's all in the way you approach things. The world system operates by selfishness. Fear stands on a platform of selfishness. Do not kid yourself. Fear is a consumption of self. You're thinking about yourself. You're thinking about what it's going to cost you. You're thinking about what it's going to do to me. I'm thinking about what, what I don't want it to do to me. To get rid of fear, you have to address any area of selfishness in your life. You have to admit that you're putting self over God. Self over his word. Your way over his way. Well, this is just our tradition. That's selfishness. Understand there's no such thing as a little fear. It's not okay to have a little bit. We all should have a little healthy fear. No. We should have enough wisdom to not have to have fear be our decider. I should be smart enough to know bad idea jumping out of a car at 80 miles an hour. I don't need to be afraid of going 80 miles an hour, just stay in the car. I might be afraid of my wife driving it at that speed, so I'll drive it. Then I won't have any fear, you hear me? Like, there's solutions and answers for things rather than being afraid. Buy a second car. She can drive her way, I can drive my way. No fear. We won't get in an argument about it. I, I, come on, I'm burnt, dumbing it down, but it's the same principle. In the book of Revelation, we see God putting those who are fearful in the same category as liars, murderers, and whoremongers. To be a believer and harbor fear is a slap in God's face. It's not a discussion. His word is clear. Fear has no place. Fear exists, but it doesn't have a place. He has given you and I direct access to every spiritual blessing in heaven. You and I don't have anything to fear. We've got to trust God first. Realize fear is a foreign spirit that does not come from God. When a Christian's reborn spirit becomes alive and regenerated in salvation. It does not have the capacity to create or produce fear. Fear comes as an attack. It's a spiritual force, but it does not attack your spirit. It attacks your soul. Just as your born-again spirit can influence your soul, so can fear. This is why the Bible says, renew your mind. That's your soul. To what? The Word, the truth of God's Word. So why? It impacts. It changes. It rearranges. What? My mind, my will, and my emotions. 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power and love and what? A sound mind. You remember J. Iris? 
in Luke chapter 8, his daughter got sick. He goes and asks Jesus to pray for her. And, uh, you know, Jesus gets distracted and a lot of things are happening. And in verse 49, it says, while, while he was, Jesus was still speaking, someone came to the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, and said, don't bother the teacher, your daughter's dead. And those words from the messenger, you know, they're, they're, they're capturing the whole family who's back at home, they're thinking. Your daughter's dead, don't trouble the master. You know, you ran out of time. He got distracted like all preachers do. They didn't call me back fast enough. They didn't drop everything they were doing and come rushing to my house because I texted them to come pray for me. You remember what Jesus was doing, the woman with the issue of blood. She touched him. He stopped to deal with that. Crowds pushing in. But Jesus, verse 50, said he heard it. And he said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Not only believe. Don't be afraid. Only believe. The first thing bad news says is uh, uh, to the soul. It speaks to the soul first. Give up. Don't believe it anymore. I prayed for that healing stuff and it didn't work. Yeah, J. Iris' daughter was dead too, but no, she wasn't. Because faith calls things that don't exist as though they do. And that's what Jesus said. Don't, don't get into fear and go down that road of surrendering. Only believe. Notice, believe and, and hope I make it on time. Believe. And, you know, give me some offering. Just believe. There was nothing else he was required to do. No penance, no works, no effort. Just, just don't fear and believe. That is the exact same thing you and I face every day of our life. Because we all got people in our life saying quit, give up. You, you don't really think that Jesus stuff works, do you? Jesus immediately dealt with the fear that would come by a bad report. And before it could establish itself in Jairus' life, he kept Jairus' mouth shut. Because he instantly told Jairus, get a hold of yourself. Basically, this is what he said. Keep your mouth shut, keep a hold of yourself, and just believe me. Because Jairus never said anything. No matter what you or the world around you is facing, the first step out of it is always the same. Stop fear. Do not give it an acceptable amount of space in your life. When Jesus arrived at J.R.'s house, of course the family's all mad because you weren't supposed to be here. She's dead. Why are you doing this? You're going to do something stupid. You're going to embarrass yourself. They were so convinced that the situation was beyond Jesus. What did they do? They got in the way, and Jesus had to deal with them. He said, don't weep, she's not dead, she's sleeping. Verse 54, but he put them all outside, took her by the hand and said, little girl, arise, and her spirit returned, and she arose immediately. Listen, this goes back to exactly what I said at the beginning of this sermon. Do not believe what the world tells you. Even when what they tell you appears to be real and true. Nobody didn't. She was obviously really dead. Her spirit had to come back in her. When your spirit leaves, what happens? You die. So they weren't lying. But neither was Jesus. So what do you do with that truth? When it is true. But so is the word. It's about what I choose to believe. I'm not denying death by believing in her life. I'm simply choosing to believe in this instead of this. You think you have to pick the real thing you're looking at. And Jesus says, no, that's the exact thing you don't want to do. Don't get your eye on it. Don't get your mouth on it. Don't get into fear about it. I'm not saying she's not dead. I'm saying she ain't dead because I believe. In what? The resurrection power of the word. To remove fear and grief, Jesus had to take over the house. He had to get rid of the unbelieving bunch. 
He had to fill the room with faith. You know why? Because only people in faith were there. Uncle Fred, Aunt Minnie, they had to go out and gripe and be mad they got kicked out of the house. Too bad. There are three things Jesus shows us here that we are to do when fear shows up. You want to stop fear? Here's how you do it. Very simple. Speak only faith when the situation looks hopeless. We're not denying the hopelessness of the situation. We're not going to talk it. We are not in denial about the situation. We are choosing God's way. So we're going to speak faith. And all the world thinks you have lost your mind. I'm going to stay in faith. Number two, remove those around you who are in fear. Quit trying to get everybody in agreement with you. You've got to understand the word. You just don't understand Jesus. Stop trying to get him to. You're in the middle of a situation. This is not the time to teach them. I remember my father giving our, our deacons instructions. when If you're going to go to the hospital and pray for somebody, that's not the place to give them a Bible study. When they're in crisis, they don't need your 40-pound lectern whipped out and an hour sermon. If you ain't got enough faith in what you're doing there to do, you need to get somebody else to go do it anyways. The, the hospital room is not where you encourage your faith to pray for them. If that's what you've got to do, call someone else to go and pray for them. And then you get in the room and get yourself built up so you are ready the next time. That's not a criticism. That's exactly what he's saying. He said, I had to remove the obstacles because we already knew Jesus knew what he was doing. Speak faith. Remove those around you that are in fear. And number three, speak to the situation in faith. Command it to change. He didn't go in there and say, man, what have I done? She's really dead. I didn't think she was. I thought they were just fooling, but she's really dead. What do I do now? He didn't do that at all. He saw the situation, but he spoke to it. He called that thing that didn't exist, she was dead, as though she wasn't dead, as though she was alive. He spoke faith. And what notice, when he spoke that faith, It wasn't a suggestion. It wasn't an opinion. It wasn't, if God be your will, bring this girl's spirit back into her body. Do you know why? He's demonstrating our position. When we have that authority and power, we're to act the same way. Well, we got it. We got that power when the Holy Spirit came in the second chapter of Acts. Are you hearing me? And now that same power is exactly what Jesus was telling us when he said, you'll do greater works and mightier things. You need me to go so that my spirit can empower my word to work through you. It isn't me doing it, but it's through me. Understand that when you operate this way, you're going to have resistance. Every time the word is heard, every time the word is received, A decision is made. Is it God's way or is it the world's way? See, Satan wants to pressure you. The enemy uses all kinds of fear, fears of death and lack and sickness, every kind of phobia in the world. Why? To keep you from being men and women of faith. I I believe a lot of Christians are caged by fear. They're, They're bound up, they're hindered from effectiveness. Fear is a way to keep you from walking in the fullness of the word, in the fullness of God's promise. Here and there it works, but not the fullness of it. We get just enough a taste to keep coming around, but not enough to be free. Hebrews uh, 2.14 says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. Now, why did Jesus do that? Why did he share in the same? Why did he have to partake flesh and blood? That through death, he might destroy. That word destroy means rendered powerless, to make of no effect. He made of no effect. He rendered powerless. He destroyed death. 
Through him who had the power of death, that is the devil. He destroyed death by destroying the power of death, the devil. Yes, our bodies might rest in the ground, but we are not dead. We have partaken of flesh and blood. That's what communion is about remembering, right? Verse 15 goes on to tell us that Jesus became a partaker with us, not in spite of us, not without us, not so we could look to him, but with us, so that he could deliver us from a lifetime of bondage. We don't have to be bound anymore. Fear is a bondage that we have been delivered from. Hebrews eleven six. 6, without faith it is impossible to please him. For, well, look at this, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. What? A rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Satan knows you've got to have faith to believe in God's promises in order for them to come to pass. If you want the impossible to be possible, then you've got to come to God believing. Not believing that he might, not believing that he could, but believing that he is. He is the answer, he is the way. He is the healer, he is the forgiver, he is the deliverer, he is the comforter and the counselor through his spirit. Are you hearing me? He is, not might, not could, not should, not hope, is. My faith has to be that. He is the answer, he is the way. Come on. We got to stop reasoning and fearing and doubting who he is. I want to ask you three questions as I wind down here tonight. Ask yourself these. Number one, whose word is getting in my heart? Faith comes by hearing the word of God, but fear comes by hearing the words of the world, of Satan. Negative words can get into your heart through your ears and what you watch and your eyes. Eventually those things will enter your mouth, what you say, and you'll begin to speak negative words. And those things will ultimately become a part of who you are. They establish their truths in your life. Some of us have established truths that don't agree with God's Word. What are you going to do with that? I can tell you the only way to deal and to change your truths begins with what you're getting in you. If you don't get something different in you, then that truth you've established, this is all it's ever going to be. This is as good as it's ever going to get. This is as good as our marriage is. This is as good as my health is. I'm telling you, some of us have accepted sickness in our life. It's just what it is. It's a, it has become your truth. I'm not saying it is true. I'm saying it's your truth. And when something's true to you, it's true. I mean, all you got to do is look around the world and see, well, how could somebody do that? Why would somebody, why would that pedophile kill all those girls and mom and the boy in the house? Why would he do that? Because he's sick. But he's not sick to himself. He's sick to us. His truth is a perversion. But not to him. As the news has brought out his background, this was normal abuse and perversion and evil this this was who he was the fact that nobody in his life I, I feel bad that the mom didn't like not see that to let that in their life but you don't know where their truth is I, i'm challenging us to really be tr truthful with ourselves what are the standards i have that are actually god's well the more words you get in you, the more those things will begin to have light shined on them. And the Word and the Spirit will begin to put pressure on your truths. And now you'll start being uncomfortable. You know what that means? You either go find somebody who ain't saying it, so you don't have to deal with it anymore, or you deal with it. Because the Word will mold or move. It'll mold you, or it'll move you. And if you don't want to deal with your, your change that is required, you'll just move to a place where it stops bothering you. I think this is why people get divorced so often. They just give up rather than 
change to make it better. I'll just find another wife. No, you won't. I mean, you might find one, but she won't be any better. Problem's you. Free marital advice there. Yes. <laughs> Whose word is getting in your life? Number two, whose side am I on? Whose word is getting in my heart? The world's, the family, the past, the addiction, or God? And whose side am I on? The world system operating by fear or the kingdom of God which operates by faith? The world system says you have to be educated, have a degree, have the right opportunity, right neighborhood, right color of skin, you got to wear the right clothes. If you contradict the system, you're going to be challenged, intimidated, threatened. You're going to be presented with every kind of fear and opportunity to quit. But the kingdom of God is not a respecter of people. He is a respecter of faith. God's word will work in spite of what everything else the world says you have to have. You can prosper without a degree because you got the mind of Christ and the wisdom of God and you're favored of the Lord. And if you have a degree, you can have all those things without all the pride and shame and guilt and corruption and evil. You don't have to play the world system. You don't have to do things their way. In the kingdom of God, you have to decide. The kingdom of God won't decide for you. He will bring your revelation. He will prompt you. He will encourage you. He'll send labors into your life. He'll do many numbers of things. He won't use sin. He won't use sickness. He won't use death. Because Jesus delivered us from those things. But he will bring his word back to your remembrance. He will bring people into your life. Certainly tests and trials he will use that you put yourself in. He didn't bring them in. Disobedience brings tests. He uses that disobedience and the test of that to bring you to a place of realization. Yeah, my way was right. Did you learn? God, lo I, I, I am a firm believer in this. Many of the things I've learned and grown and matured in were the things that I put myself in and God's grace and mercy got me out of. And in the journey of getting out of, I learned through that test. Don't do that again. And I did not blame God for it. I gave God the glory that he redeemed me out of it and didn't just give up on me and leave me there. Number three, and I'll end with this, what, what am I connected to? Fear is a spiritual connector. And so is faith. You're, you are choosing to connect to something Faith will connect you to the word. Fear will connect you to the very thing you fear. You'll be absorbed by avoidance, staying away from, not being around it. Fear of death will connect you to death. Fear of lack will connect you to lack. Fear of sickness will connect you to cancer or sickness or disease. Don't allow fear to connect you to the negative circumstances that are surrounding those problems. Instead, use faith. Release the blessing of God over that. Speak back to that thought. Speak back to that image. Speak back to that anxiety that's trying to bring itself an opportunity to be afraid. When, I, when, I, when it comes to fear, as I close, don't be ignorant. Don't be ignorant of his power. Stop thinking that it's all or nothing. Don't, stop thinking that because it is a force that I don't have authority over it. Fear can cause bad things to happen in people's lives. And you and I can't afford to harbor it, allow it, give it permission. There is no better time than a hearing a sermon like this to choose to eradicate it from your mind. Remember this, the devil don't care about your decision to follow God. Oh, I'm going to follow you, Lord. He don't care. He ain't impressed with that. He don't, oh, stay away from him. He's not afraid of that. His approach is simple. I'm just going to keep wearing on him and wearing on him and wearing on him till he cracks. You know the Bible talks about when the word of God is sown into your heart, immediately he comes to steal it. He's, going to, he's not going to steal it by like, you know, just taking it without your permission. He's going to steal it by doubt, worry, anxiety, reason. He's going to get you to give it up. That's how he steals it. You surrender it. You don't have to. He's going to keep bringing obstacles and opportunities to try to get you back in that cage of being afraid. 
But you've got to remember what we talked about tonight. He's rendered powerless. I have God's word. I have God's truth. I have God's promises. I do not have to entangle myself in the bondage of fear. When things get difficult, become a word person. Excel and put pressure on the word. Don't become a world person. Anybody can go through a trial. Come out beaten and worn out. Say, whoo, I'm a survivor. I don't believe God wants survivors. He wants overcomers. He did not do all that he did in Christ so we could survive. When the storm comes, you know what happens? Those built on the word and the rock, they're in the same condition they were before. They're not worn out. They don't come out of there with a testimony of survival. Their testimony is overcoming. Boy, I just stood established. I'm rooted deep. I'm planted by the river of living water. Are you hearing me tonight? you got to decide which way you will go. Will I cave and fold or will I stay grounded? The decision is yours. I challenge you, find scripture relating to the issues you're dealing with. Start meditating on them. Start challenging what you're listening to, what you're thinking about. Operate from a position of love and selflessness. Just measure the amount of selfishness involved in your thinking. Is everything you're thinking about that problem consuming you? What can I do? What should I do? How should I? Who should I call to help me? Me, 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 me. There's no faith in that. And that's exactly what fear does. It gets you consumed. And I'm telling you, listen, boy, it's easy to preach this stuff from up here. But you spent a life living like that. It, it's become so second nature. You, you have to make yourself judge every thought before you catch it. That's how many slide in. I don't know how many times I've swore myself I'll never eat a bowl of ice cream again and I'm eating it before I realize, you swore you would never do this. I literally scooped it out and ate it and then I realized I said I would never do that again. What happened at the counter? It's just this is what you do. You eat it. This is, this is good. This sounds like a good idea. Like I didn't even resist that thought. I mean, it's ice cream, but it's the same thing. It's the same thing. We, we cannot continue to live our life the same way and expect something different to happen. Make a decision to, to measure and judge and evaluate thoughts and opinions, feelings. Stop letting them have place without, without conflict. Attack that thought. Attack that feeling. Rebuke that idea. Do something dutiful for your own good. Instead of just accepting the fate of what comes in your head. Accepting the fate of what the world says about you. It doesn't say in Revelation because the world's getting bad, his sons and daughters. Remember this, listen. I'm not getting into the rapture story. I'm already too, too long. But remember this. The next time somebody wants to tell you that the church is going to go through the rapture, then you just get somebody then to explain to you that, that would God treat the bride of Christ that way. You show me in the Bible where it shows and tells me that God would treat his son's bride the way you expect him to be treated in the, in the, in the tribulation. God does not treat his son's bride, and we the church are his bride. So I ain't going to sweat it. I got to source and a power available to me i'm not going to be afraid when the world falls apart i'm going to i'm going to press into his ways i'm going to press into his word i'm going to press into his wisdom i'm going to learn to hear his voice so i lead it and it guides me and his word becomes the truth in my life instead of my feelings amen father in the name of jesus thank you for the power of this word tonight we sow it into their hearts open to receive. Holy Spirit, bring it back to their remembrance. We are challenging ourselves tonight to be more dedicated, to challenge, to attack the thoughts of, of, of wayward, slothful, lazy, surrender. No, we will not let persecution and difficulty keep us from doing all that you have called us to do. We are overcomers. Fear, 
We rebuke you in the name of Jesus. We bind your influence. You do not have the right. Your power has been defeated by the blood of Jesus. You are under our feet. Satan is bound. His influence is bound. And we are free. We are free in Christ. We are overcomers in Christ. We are mighty in Christ. We are pulling down strongholds in our mind. Oh, I plead the blood of Jesus over you and your thoughts. And I curse fear from its existence in your life. And I thank you, Father, that we leave here tonight committed to be doers of the word we heard and not hearers only. Oh, I pray for your blessing and protection, and we thank you that your word is working mightily in us. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, amen. Amen. Praise God. We are so blessed to have you here tonight. God is so good. Amen. We want to give you an opportunity before you leave tonight to give your tithes and offerings. Ushers, while you're in the aisle, raise your hand if you'd like to have an envelope. Uh, For those visiting, if you got a visitor card, if you'll fill that out and give it to the cafe when you leave, we got a gift for you just to say thank you for being here. Uh, We won't pester you or show up at your house at ungodly times. We just want to know your name and say thank you for being here. And uh, for the rest of you, if you'd like to give and to sow tonight, we would encourage you, as always, to be faithful doers of His Word. Amen. Whatever God has placed on your heart to do, to do that. If you have uh, payments for mission trips or C4C, you can do that. If you'd like to give online, you can see on the screen the different ways to do it electronically. Come on over here, Jen. She's got some announcements. I'm going to pray for it, and then uh, you can uh, collect it up, ushers. Again, thank you for your faithfulness. God is so good. Amen. You know, I want to encourage you. We got uh, the first of the month coming up, and uh, the first Sunday of every month, we take time for testimony. And so I would encourage you to uh, give God some glory. Amen. The couple on the second row been emailing me about a seed they sowed and how God is just continuing to prosper and bless them from it. And those kinds of testimonies encourage all of our faith. That's what testimonies are about. It's not bragging on you, it's bragging on the Jesus in you. Amen. So be thinking about that. Amen. We don't want to have to twist your arm to get you to say something good about God. All right. I believe the word I'm sowing in your lives is working and producing, and God is uh, faithful to it. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, this seed we have to give tonight, we do it in faith. We do it with expectation. We give you all the glory and praise for it. And we remind you with this seed that we are doers of your word and you are a doer of that word and bring it to pass in our life. Good measure. Pressed down, shaken together and running over. Father, the windows of heaven are poured out upon our lives as we sow our tithes and we give our offerings. Oh, we do it in faith and expectation and we receive your blessing now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you for being here. This is a mighty sound for every field is right. And the Spirit of the living God is on us to bind our broken hearts, to cause the blind to see. This is our mighty sound to set the